Psalms 51. Psalms 51, starting in verse 1. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, yes. and cleanse me from my yes. sin. Yes. For I acknowledge my transgressions, and my sin is ever before yes. me. Against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest, and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was sharpened, shapen in iniquity, and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou de desirest truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness, that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins, and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Amen. Focus verses this morning is one through three. Have mercy upon me, O God, According to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies, bind out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from mine iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge. Yes. For I acknowledge my transgressions. Yes. And my sin is ever before me. Amen. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Yes. Amen. Dear Lord, I love you, Lord. I appreciate you. I thank you very dumb for us. I thank you about you. We have gathered together. I pray in Jesus' name that you have your way in this place, Lord. Speak to hearts and minds. Help us to understand and receive, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our thought is coming from this simple verse in verse 10, create in me a clean heart. Amen. You may be seated. God is so good. Amen. And so many times it gets overlooked sometimes. We are coming into the season where we celebrate the birth of Christ. Amen. And the birth of Christ is only for one reason, one reason only, redemption. Amen. Amen. It wasn't because he just figured that one day it'd be cool just to be born as a baby. Right. Right. I think I'll just try something different. Redemption was his plan and has always been his plan. Amen. Amen. The Bible makes it clear that sin is pervasive in our world. And let's also add in the church. Amen. Why? Because we're all humans. And the church is made up of, first and foremost, humans. Mm -hmm. Amen. So we have to always guard, not only in our own lives, but in the sin, in, in the body itself, as far as the church is concerned. 
Amen. So we always have to be aware and watchful. Ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, every human has been born with a natural propensity to sin. And get a load of this. And I, I thought this to be kind of a simple thought, but as parents, we will say, yeah. This can be easily proven by asking parents which is harder, teaching kids to do bad or to do good. Yeah. <laughs> Amen. I don't teach my kids to draw on the wall. Yeah. <laughs> they just did it all on their own. I mean, what bigger canvas than a big giant yeah. eight by eight foot wall? Uh huh. I have to teach them that. I have to teach them they shouldn't go someplace that they sh that they not go someplace that they shouldn't. I don't teach them that. Right. Uh -huh. Amen. <laughs> so uh, most parents will testify that doing bad comes naturally to their children. That doesn't make them bad children, does it? It doesn't mean we love them less, do we? Right, yes. <laughs> I know there's sometimes we might lose our cotton picking minds. Mm -hmm. Make us pull our hair out and turn gray prematurely. I understand that. But it doesn't mean we don't love them. Amen. They're our children. Mm -hmm. But children must be taught to do good. Right, yes. Amen. And just in case anyone would try to pretend exemption from the natural inclination to sin, the writers of Scripture repel that notion. Paul famously wrote, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. So just in case you might have an idea to pretend that that's not natural, the inclination to sin. Paul just wrote it just in case in Romans to remind us that all have sinned. Yes. Yes. And another New Testament writer rebuked those who claimed perfection, saying, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive everybody else. No, we're deceiving ourselves. And the truth is not in us. And if we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. Did we get that? If we say we have not sinned, we make God a liar. Because God says all have sinned. But I haven't. So God must be lying. See how that is? And then it, then it goes on to say... His word is not in us. The meaning, we, 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 we skip the whole part about all of sin right. and falling short of the glory of God. We skipped all the part about need for repentance and all that other stuff. We skip all of that because the word just is not in us. If we can, with straight face, say, I have not sinned. <laughs> the truth can easily be seen by observing some of the spiritual giants in Scripture. Moses, Abraham, David, Paul, Peter. All had moments when they participated in horrendous sin. Amen. I love the part where Jesus told Peter, you get the 93 times, and Peter said, I would never would do that. But then he finds himself warming beside a strange fire. Hanging out with people who are not followers of God, and they right. point at him and say, "Weren't you a follower?" Oh no! It's easy to deny Christ when you spend all your time at strange fires. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. That's why sometimes we always have to be careful who we associate with. That's right. Amen. Amen. A frustrating reality of life is that we all will be tempted. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
No one is exempt. Right. So Paul described the temptations we face as being common. Even Christ was tempted by Satan in the wilderness. And the writer of Hebrews noted that Jesus was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. However, there is an important distinction to be made. Being tempted is not a sin. Right, right, right. right. Amen. Oh, let me, let me go so far as the more often... You sense temptation. It might indicate the closer you are to God. So for those of us who may be going through this life and say, you know what? I haven't really been tempted that much. Well then, how close are you then to God? Something to ponder, something to think about. The more we see the enemy at work in our lives should be a greater indication the closer we are to God. Right. Mm -hmm. When we have a natural propensity to sin, he doesn't need to do much. Yeah. <laughs> but the closer we get to God, the less we do, the more he notices. Right? Mm -hmm. Problem we have is in choosing whether to give in to the temptation or not. Paul wrote. In 1 Corinthians 10, 13, God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, mm -hmm. but will, with the temptation, also make a way to escape, and ye may be able to bear it. Whenever we are tempted, we should immediately turn to God and look for a way of escape. Amen. We should always, whenever we find ourselves captive by the enemy, within our power, make every effort we can to escape. Mm -hmm. To get out. Mm -hmm. To fight. Whatever it takes. Never, Amen. never give up. Amen. Even though all have sinned, and we never will achieve perfection in the flesh. There is still hope. After reminding this re his readers that everyone has sinned, John encouraged my little children, these things write I unto you that ye sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Amen. Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation for our sin. Amen. And not for ours only but also for the sins of the whole world. Amen. Amen. We look at what's going on in the whole world today, mm -hmm. and we should not be shocked. Yeah. Right. Amen. That's why... It is very difficult sometimes because we can see it creeping in and the, and the ideas and the thought patterns can creep in. Uh -huh. If we're not watchful to make ourselves aware of how the enemy is trying to get in. The word propitiation can also be translated as atoning sacrifice. So by fast sacrificing himself on the cross, Jesus paid the price for our sins. Now our sins are so great, both individually and collectively, that we could never hope to make up for them. We can never get good enough 
to do in or do enough good deeds to atone for our own sins. Fortunately, Jesus' death paid the price. Amen. We talked about the other day, we talked about Thursday night, we talked about taking possession. Mm -hmm. We talked about, about living in the promise by taking possession of it. Just because we are promised something doesn't mean it's automatically ours. We have got to go take possession of it. Amen. 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 <clears throat> Just like the propitiation or the atoning power of God. He died for everybody. But it doesn't mean it is ours until we take possession of it. Amen. It doesn't just, I mean, it's there, mm -hmm. but if we don't claim it, we all receive it. Amen. We think about how, how great the blessings are for those that claim it. There's a video game out there that when you achieve certain goals, that they give prizes or, or, or helps or treasures or whatever you want to call it. But if you don't go and claim it, at the end of the day, they just disappear. <clears throat> So it is very important that you take advantage of all your efforts by claiming the treasures. Uh-huh. So too many times there is a treasure of redemption. It doesn't just open up and pour out on them. Amen. And in the game. His mercy every day. Why? We're not living on yesterday's mercy. We're not living on last week's mercies. We're not living on whatever year it was. For me, it was like 30 some years ago when I repented. We're not living on 30 year old mercies. Amen. Right. Amen. Why do our mercies renew every day? Because our sin renews every day. Amen. Uh huh. <laughs> Thank God his mercies are new every day. Why? Because my sin is renewed every day. Amen. Psalms 51 provides a great example for us to follow when we sin. David's example should make us more willing to confess and repent of our own sins. I can't repent of your sins. I can repent of sins done towards you and ask for you to forgive, but I cannot repent for your sins. Amen. After all, if even the great King David could make a mistake in sin, then who are we to pretend? That's why there's people like David in the Bible. Yes. That's why not all the people in the Bible walked on clouds and, and, and were pure and perfect. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. I mean... I know we, we sometimes go through the Word of God and we maybe pick out our, our favorite characters from history. That is, but, but, but I haven't heard anybody, I haven't heard anybody say, my favorite Bible character is Samson. Or my favorite or Bible character is Job. Right? Oh, oh we, we, we don't claim them as our 
favorites. Right. Because we don't like their story. Right. As well as we like the shepherd made king, David. Right. Mm -hmm. Or the three Hebrew boys, or Daniel. Right. Or Esther. Or Ruth. Amen. We have cats. Most of all you know, we usually try to maintain a crop of two. <laughs> and one passes away, then we will get a second one because we have a tendency to notice that we were going to just stick with one, but he got very lonely, and he started to mold. <laughs> Too much energy, <laughs> and now he's rethinking his life. Yeah. I see him curled up in the corner, pondering, <laughs> and remembering the days when that kitten wasn't around, and he had the whole place to himself. He wasn't on a a strict diet just because the kitten's on a diet. He just, so, but we have, I said that to say this, we have, I don't know why or how it started, but we started naming our cats Bible characters, <laughs> Bible names. And when you do that, we start going through a list of names that would, that not necessarily say it's a good cat name, but, you know, a good name for a cat. Now, we had a cat named Samson. He got that cat, that name, because he... We, we, when he was a kitten, he would, he would camp out by the trash can. Literally lay there and wait for the opportunity to get into the trash. You know, Samson, you know, always looking, for always looking for trouble. I thought that was a perfect name for him, so we changed, and he was small enough, so we changed his name to Samson just because that was his characteristic. But when you're doing that, all of a sudden you start to realize that name's in the Bible. That name's in the Bible. That name's in. I never heard anybody say, you know, my favorite Bible character name is Dorcas. Right. I used to call my sister Dorks. <laughs> and then when we found out there was a late a name Dorcas in the Bible, then I just linked it up and you're Dorcas. <laughs> Silly kids. We all have sinned. <laughs> and his mercies are new every day. <laughs> so, you know, it, it's easy to pick out those names that, that are kind of, you know, the popular ones, but nobody ever wants to claim those other names or those characters that have kind of a shady, cloudy past. So, it, 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 so when you talk about David and we talk about his, and he's like, oh, you know, we all, we all love David, but David made mistakes. Yes. Very terrible mistakes. And one in particular was while he, while the men were all fighting, David was taking a spin around the roof of his mansion. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to look over the, over the roof, the house roofs around the that were around him and he noticed somebody very beautiful taking a bath and lounging on the other roof and David decided that he wanted to be with her and so he was and then she got pregnant and then David devised a plan to bring her husband home from the battlefield so that he could lay with her so then David could say well it must be his but when that man had more character than David did, says, how can I go home right. and leave him while my men are out in the field fighting? Mm -hmm. right. So David then devised another plan. Well, then I'll just have him killed. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he did. And then Nathan 
the priest came to him and told him a story about a, a farmer who had one sheep. And his, and his rich neighbor moved in and stole that one sheep from the farmer and left him destitute. And David said, who was this man so that I can do something about it as a king? And the man of God looked at him and said, it was you, David. <clears throat> and that was what brought about the Psalms that we had read this morning. So like all sin, it cannot remain hidden forever. And in this instance, God revealed David's sin to Nathan the prophet. Nathan confronted David and caused him to realize the seriousness and gravity of his sin. So even when, even then, David could have chosen to remain stubborn and refuse to admit wrongdoing. Mm -hmm. Oh, let me stop there for a second. We are aware that the bloodline of David produced Jesus. We are aware of this. Amen. But yet the Bible says Jesus was perfect without sin. Amen. Tempted in many ways as we were, but you didn't give in. Mm -hmm. There are thoughts out there that even in the Bible times that they thought that children paid for the sins of their parents. And if this was the case, then Jesus would not have been without sin. But, so let me add that to this list of things of saying. I don't pay for your sins. Your children don't pay for your sins. Right. <clears throat> you can't blame your life on your parents. Too many times people want to resign their ability to choose and just say, I didn't have a choice. Yes, you have a choice. Right. Yes. yes, you can make a change. Amen. Yes, we can. Amen. And so David saw this, and even though David did this thing, that was still the bloodline of Jesus Christ. It shows God's ability to forgive Amen. and forget. Amen. <clears throat> oh, I wish we could forgive and forget our own lives as easy as God can. Amen. Because we constantly punish ourselves. For things that God has already given us for. Right. By reminding God. Uh -huh. Amen. <clears throat> Even then, David could have chosen to remain stubborn and refuse to admit wrongdoing. I don't know what you're talking about, Nathan. If he had done so, he likely would have gone down the path of Saul, his predecessor, and refused to humble himself before God. If David had not repented, God would have rejected him as king, even as he did Saul. Fortunately, David finally took that opportunity to repent and ask God for forgiveness. David confessed his sin to the man of God and publicly in the form of Saul because he recorded his repentance in written form, we know we now have a pattern to follow when we sin, whether or not our sin is as drastic as David's. I want to stop right there. That word sin is as drastic. Sin is sin. Amen. Just because David did what he did doesn't make his sin worse. Than someone who just, you know, right, mm -hmm. right, 
Right. Now, morally, we look at that and say, how dare he? Well, you can't do that. It's sin. And there are times that, like I said, I take issue with some things that some people may write. And this is how sometimes that we do not. Oh, I don't know why it is sometimes. But there are areas in, in churches that we have a tendency to shun people for. We shun people for some things, but not for others. For some, we say, oh, there's room for repentance. And for others, we say, oh, you got to do a whole lot better than that. Uh -huh. Yep. Huh? Mm -hmm. So if we're going to be real forgiving on some areas, we got to learn to be forgiving on other areas. Amen. Amen. I just heard this week of a couple of situations in a couple of people's lives that are being shunned and are being outcast because of something that's going on in their lives and their family's lives and it's like hold on here that shunning right. according to the word of God is a sin right. and it is in the same category sin as every other sin right. Right. <clears throat> amen so we so many times want to categorize well, my sin isn't as bad as his sin, or right. my sin isn't as bad as her sin. Right. Why do we do that? Make us feel better about ourselves. Right. <laughs> Make us feel better about our own sins. Yes. When we try to compare our sins with everybody else's sins. But the Bible doesn't say, well, we've got a punishment it's the same judgment for every sin. Right. Hello? Right. So while we sit in judgment, we're sinning. Too many times we fool ourselves when we try to categorize sins as worse than other sins. Hmm. Hello? Mm -hmm. So, even though we look at David and say, man, oh man, I haven't done anything like that. The call to repentance is the same. Amen. <laughs> I go to the gas pump. And I, and we have many different vehicles in our fleet. <laughs> <laughs> and I could go to the pump and put the same amount of gas in every vehicle. But for some reason, the needles I wish my needle on my vehicle had the same space of movement as the needle on my daughter's vehicle. Right. Because yeah. $25 go farther for her than it does for me. Right. Right. Why? God's mercy is not measured out. Right. Amen. Based on our sin. Yes. That's right. God doesn't have to give us more mercy because we deem our sin worse or right. somebody deems our sin worse than theirs. Right. Mm -hmm. God doesn't say, oh, that's $50 worth of mercy right there. Right. <laughs> right. Right. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. 
That's $75 worth of mercy right there. Ooh, some sins take a whole lot more mercy than other sins. <laughs> I'm glad it's not like that with David, with, with God. Amen. Folks, I think we should temper down our enthusiasm when it comes to determining one sin from another. And if we would learn to just realize that God's mercy is, a, God doesn't divide up his mercy based on the difficulty of sin. Huh, right. Amen. Amen. God's mercy is the same mercy, yes. whether it's we deem big sin or little sin. Right. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. So, our sins, no matter what they may be, are as drastic as David's sins. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's just the truth of the scripture. <clears throat> the first line of David's prayer was humble and straightforward. Have mercy upon me, O God. And David confessed his need for God and his mercy for his need for God and his mercy. In order to truly repent, we must confess that we need God. Furthermore, we must admit that God is the only one who can cleanse us from our sin. Yes. Right, right. David did so and plainly, wash me thoroughly with my iniquity, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my <clears throat> sin. For I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. David recognized that God was the only answer for his situation. Amen. You notice David didn't all of a sudden go running to Nathan and said, Oh, please forgive me. He fell on his knees and immediately went to God. Right. Too many times we seek after one another's approvals which is what causes us to lie and to be deceptive in the first place. Mm -hmm. David also gained a bigger perspective on the nature of sin. He prayed, against thee and thee only have I sinned. Too many times we so quickly want, want to claim to be victims to someone else's sin or the object of someone else's sin. And David said, no, it was me and me alone. Bathsheba, she had her own repenting to do. And David had his own to do. David also recognized his sin nature. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. However, simply because he was born sinful, he was not absolved from needing to be cleansed. David continued, purge me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Mm -hmm. It is not sufficient to pray for forgiveness and cleansing alone. A person's heart is cleansed, but nothing good replaces it then that person will likely fall into sin again. That's why it's so very important that when we not just repent, then all of a sudden we have to anticipate the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Why? Because that repentance leaves a void. That's right. And then it has to be filled with something else. Right. Amen. Oh, did you ever notice maybe sometimes your level of Holy Ghost that may be on your meter determines on how often you may do something wrong? Think about that for a minute. If our heart was like a gas tank right. and the Holy Ghost was like fuel, the more room there is, the less fuel there is in the tank, right. the more air gets in it. Right. I think that might be why the Bible talks about keeping your lamps full. 
is a full lamp that keeps the light burning. Right. Right. Amen. Amen. It's imperative. The Bible says that the lamp is lit and full when the bridegroom comes. Why? Because when the, the meter or the tank is full, it pushes out all those things that might have a hold of it. Yes. Right. Yes. Amen. Mm. That's why sometimes we as apostolics always catch ourselves around, you need a good dose of the ghost. You ever heard that phrase any lately or anymore? Amen. We need a good dose of the ghost. Amen. It's very important that we not after repentance and we fill it back up. Yes, yes. And that's what we're saying. Purge me. When I was in the military, one of the things that we had to do was our unit or our squad had our own assigned vehicles. And once a quarter, was it a quarter? I think once a quarter, we had to get underneath that vehicle and grease all the grease zerks. Now, I don't know if any of you have ever done this before, but when you crawl underneath a Hummer, <laughs> there are tons of those things. <clears throat> every joint, every knuckle, every pivot point, every power point, there was a grease zerk. And you had to attach a grease gun to it, and some of them were easy to reach, and some of them were not. Some you literally, good thing the vehicles were high, you had to literally crawl underneath the vehicle, lay on the ground, and look up at the bottom of this beast. Every wheel had at least probably five or six zerks, based on the drive shaft, the, the every, every pivot point there was a grease zerk, everything. And we would put grease in, and well, how do you know when it's full? What's that? <laughs> yes. What we called at that time is purging. Right. So what happens when it's full, then the old grease purges out through the bearings or through the fittings to show you that it's full. Sure. <laughs> so when it talks about purge me, right. purging you, filling you up and the out with the bad stuff. Right. Amen. 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 And you can tell when you got good grease and bad grease because yeah. it'll purge out the old grease. Right. And then when the grease is new and clean, then you can stop. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We call that purging. Right. So whenever I see that word in the Bible, it makes me think of that. I spend a lot of time purging. <laughs> and that's what David is trying to say purge me with hyssop yeah. and I shall be clean wash me and I shall be whiter than snow it is not sufficient to pray for forgiveness and cleansing alone if a person's heart is cleansed but nothing good replaces it then that person will likely fall into sin again that's what I'm trying to get us to understand. David prayed, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. David knew only God could provide him with a clean heart and deal with his carnality that had led him to commit those atrocious sins. <clears throat> One of the most desperate and passionate passages of this entire prayer comes when David cries out, Cast me not away from thy presence, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Early in his life, David had witnessed God's Holy Spirit being taken from Saul. David saw the terrible path Saul went down, and David did not want to go down the same path. Path. Yes. Amen. Amen. So when we repent, we must not only ask for our sins to be forgiven and our hearts to be cleansed. Why is it <coughs> that we can see other people's demise, but we can never see our own? 
Why is it that we can so easily say, well, look at the path they headed down, uh -huh. but yet not see the same path we're on? Right. Think about that. You know, it's always easier to see other people's paths. Right. <laughs> we need to be careful. We need to be focused on our own path. Amen. It's when the enemy's got us looking in other directions is how he's able to get us to go in the wrong direction. And then that, that's when we start to realize, oh, they're heading down a darker path than I'm heading down. Are they? Right. Or maybe they're just as blind on their path as you are on yours. Or we are on ours. <clears throat> Amen. I think was a what does the Bible say about um, don't complain about the, the mote in one person's eyes if you've seen the beam in your eye? Mm -hmm. When we sin, we must seek the Lord for forgiveness. Even though Christ has already died for our sins, this does not excuse us from having to ask him for forgiveness. God is gentle and respectful of our wishes, and he will allow us to remain in our sin if we so desire. Right. Mm -hmm. Moreover, we should not just repent and ask for forgiveness once. We should learn to live a lifestyle of repentance, asking for forgiveness often. Mm -hmm. In order to stay pure, the best practice is to repent regularly and ask for forgiveness of any and all sins in our lives both what we are aware of and what we are not. When people repent and receive forgiveness, they often use powerful language to describe it. Freeing, liberating, a fresh start. These words sound like someone being released from prison. And repentance is truly a similar experience. Repentance is a necessary and important first step on our journey to God.